I'm Dick Moberg, and for more than 40 years, I've been developing technology to advance our understanding of the injured brain. I've had a chance to work with some of the leading minds in the field of neuromonitoring, including physicians, researchers, and entrepreneurs. I want to share their stories with you in the form of a weekly podcast so you can stay current on the latest developments in the field and the innovative people behind them. This is my neural network. Hi, I'm Dick Moberg, and my guest today is Daiwai Olson. He's a professor in the departments of neurology and neurotherapeutics and in neurological surgery at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. He's also editor-in-chief of the Journal of Neuroscience Nursing. Those who know him know he's an amazing teacher, a brilliant researcher, and an avid geocacher, and he's an entertainer who keeps us all laughing. And if I were to rank all my friends who are interesting and slightly off the wall, Daiwai would be very near the top of the list. So, Daiwai, welcome to our podcast. Well, thank you. So, would I be at the top of the list of interesting or at the top of the list of off the wall? I'd say uh, probably both, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the person that's top of the list is somebody that I know from Burning Man, so we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and you're going sometime, I know. Yeah. Good, yeah. So, cool. So, Daiwai is passionate about many aspects of neuroscience nursing, but what we're going to focus on in this podcast is on misconceptions in monitoring ICP from a nursing perspective. But before we get started, Daiwai, we need to talk about a topic more endearing to me than neuroscience, and that's surfing. You just got back from Hawaii with your granddaughter and grandson, so how'd the surfing go? Um, uh, it did not go well for me. I, I actually... Uh, <laughs> We went uh, just off one of the Marine Corps bases. My son's a, son-in-law is a Marine, and um, the waves were a little bit bigger than the old man could handle. So I managed to to get up three times, but uh, it was really cool. My my grandson's five, my granddaughter's seven, and both of them are surfing better than I am. <laughs> a little humiliating. Huh? I'm sure it, that's it, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I used to be better, but I think they're they're quickly surpassing. Yeah, that sounds like the what I what I would experience. <laughs> I used to surf yeah. when I was a kid, but yeah, big waves aren't the thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm going. It, it's interesting. I'm I'm going for a bigger board and a smaller wave. <laughs> sounds good. All right, cool. All right, let's get going on the ICP. So. Yeah, I. The more I study intracranial pressure, the more I study ICP, the more I I think it's all just myth and innuendo. In what sense? Um, well, you know, so when we think about intracranial, when, when we think about ICP, there's a couple of mantras that come up. One is um, everybody says, "Oh, ICP is based on something called the Monroe Kelly or Monroe Keeley doctrine." And that's the first big myth. In fact, uh, back in 1784, when, when Dr. Monroe published his, his big article, he never even mentioned CSF. If you read the article, he, he, he never talks about CSF. In fact, what he talked about was that, uh, you can't, change mass. He felt that the brain was a nearly incompressible, not not incompressible, but nearly incompressible mass. And then 40, 50 years later, 1824, I think it was, um, somewhere around there, uh, George Keeley did a stud, wrote a paper, and it, a, an amazing title, and I'll paraphrase the title, but the title was something like, uh, uh, a study of two of the three sailors who washed up on the shores of Leith in uh, 1823 and basically cut their heads off and then looked at, uh, at, at volume. And if you think about it, if you, if you sever the head, which makes sense in the 1800s, right? If you're going to study the brain, you don't take this big bloated body into your lab, right? You just take the head from this, this sailor who washed ashore and you take that in. And when you, if you cut the head off, the CSF is going to drain out. So George Keeley 
also did not know about CSF. In fact, it wasn't until Magindi discovered CSF after Keeley had published that we start to see CSF. And then later on, uh, folks started attributing that because George Keeley said he agreed with with Monroe, and Monroe had said that you can't get any blood into the brain if you don't get blood out of the brain. Then, then uh, finally, they added uh, CSF to this formula, and the formula has been published as the amount of blood plus the amount of brain plus the amount of CSF is a static pressure. But any change in any one of those three compartments changes pressure. So the biggest myth I have is a gripe with is that ICP monitoring is not based on Monroe. It's not based on Keeley. It's attributed to them. But it's all a loose foundation. The other big thing is uh, we say it's a closed box. The skull is a closed box. But it's not. There's There's... Oh, at least 50 different foramina. So it's a closed box with a whole lot of holes. Imagine if you had a, a bucket with a, with 50 holes in it. That's not a closed bucket. You're not going to carry much water on that. And, um, so some of those foundations are important. Um, I think the other, Dick, did you ever have a water bed? I know you had a water bed. Well, back in college, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So remember when waterbeds were first invented, and I, I admit I, in the 70s I had a waterbed. Um, when waterbeds were first invented, there were no baffles. In other words, it was one big bladder. And if you moved even a little bit, it caused this wave to move through the waterbed, and your partner would 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 be awakened, and and the two of you would move, and and all night long this thing was just waving back and forth. And then in the the late eighties, they invented baffles or compartments, and that slowed down this wave, this impulse. So if you moved, you may have changed the pressure in the waterbed right underneath of you. But then that wave hit baffles, and your partner never saw that change. Well, think about the brain. Think about the brain within the skull. There's tons of compartments, and there's been good work. I think about the folks in the Pacific Northwest who have done some phenomenal studies where they look at intracranial pressure being different in different areas of the brain. And most of what we've done with ICP monitoring goes goes uh, towards the assumption that if you measure the ICP inside the ventricle in the brain, and it's either ventricle, that that somehow reflects all of the pressure in every area of the brain. And I just think that's that's absurd. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. The physics don't make sense. If, if, uh, in fact, if that were true, we might never have shift, right? If you have a shift, a left to right shift, a pineal shift or something, that means that the pressure on one side must be greater than the pressure on the other side in order to cause that tissue to shift over, at least at some point in time. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, over time, those pressures may equilibrate, but we don't know what that time is. Is that is that over the course of of one half of one second? Is that over the course of a day? Is the time for pressures within the brain to equilibrate the same? For someone who has already got a mass effect versus uh, an 18-year-old healthy athlete with no intracranial pathology at all. So what are we missing when we monitor intracranial pressure the way we monitor it? 
And that's where I think, um, I, I think what the, the best example of what we're missing is it's most common that once every hour we write down a number that we call ICP. So at the very least, you have to agree with me that we are missing 59 minutes worth of data. In other words, we're getting less than 2% of the available data. I think what's uh, what's 1 divided by 60, like 1.6 or something like that, right? Yep. Okay. It was, I, I know someone listening to this podcast has like grabbed a calculator and checked me. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that right now. <laughs> I'll get right back to you. Because <laughs> right. that's the important part. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But at the very least, right, like, you know, if you write down a number at the end of an hour, you're getting less than 2% of the data. So, and it's not, it's not that that data is not available to us. It's there, right? The patient had an ICP monitor in their brain, in their skull, for the whole hour. That data was available to us. We're choosing to ignore it. And um, and I don't think that's a good idea. I, I, I think we're missing valuable information. Um, and I think it's leading to to a lot of discrepancies. You know, um, we we've done a couple different studies in in my team here, uh, both where where I was before. And now that I'm in in Dallas, where we're looking at trying to get a deeper understanding of the assumptions behind intracranial pressure monitoring. So, for instance, if uh, if a physician and, and for everybody listening to the podcast, I, I, I think it's fair for me to remind, I am giving a perspective of a bedside nurse. So uh, for the other nurses out there, yay, for the physicians, this might be new news to you. But a physician comes in and asks me at 305, what's the ICP? If I tell him the number I wrote down at 3 p.m., I need to know that He's, what, what are, what are his assumptions behind that? Is he assuming that the number I give him at 3 p.m. reflects everything that happened inside that patient's skull between 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock? Is he assuming that, that I, I watched the ICP for an entire hour and then wrote down one number that I think reflects that? Cause that's what Tony Marmaru had instructed us to do way back, you know, 30 years ago. Tony felt that the best way to figure out ICP was you watch it for an hour and you you write down a number. That number reflects the previous hour. The way we're doing it now oftentimes is that the nurse walks into the room at two minutes till three o'clock and whatever number happens to be up on the screen and is captured by the EMR gets put into the document. It gets put into the chart. Well, imagine as a thought experiment that at two o'clock the patient's ICP was 12. Uh, they have, uh, B waves, lumbar B waves and, uh, shortly after that, like 215, 220, they're up in the 20s or 30s. And then it so happens that between 255 and 302, their ICP is back down to 10. The question I have is, do you care that the patient's ICP was 30 for a sustained period of time? And I think it's important. Or if it's not important, then I'm not sure why we're monitoring ICP. You uh, you opened my eyes to this with the publication that is where you looked at it continuously and then looked at what what was written down and, and the discrepancies and you know it really opened a lot of people's eyes to uh, to how you can make wrong decisions with that. Yeah. So um, 
we we think of ghosting. So so ghosting uh, happens. I I, I know uh, this comes from the engineers that if you look at at um, at a trend or a waveform that. Uh, if you can imagine a, a, a graph where at two o'clock the ICP is documented at ten, and at three o'clock the ICP is documented at, at fifteen, that looks like an upward trend. But if it so happened that you can picture these these nice uh, nice sinus type of waveforms that you happened to have sampled when the ICP was lower at its lowest point at two, and you happen that you sampled when it's at its highest point at three, it's conceivable that the ICP could be going up, going down, or moving. And this, we've done a, a couple different studies, and one of them that uh, was fascinating is the ICP documented has almost no chance of reflecting what happened in the previous five minutes, nor predicting what will happen in the next five to 15 minutes. And those, the, that study was done with stable patients. Then um, we've also done uh, a, another study where we're looking just at documentation practices. And um, the problem I have there is across the globe, across the globe, we all do it differently. Now that may not have made a big difference back in in uh, Alexander Monroe's day when when the world was way bigger. But right now, if uh, Raymond Helbach pu- publishes a paper out of Europe on ICP monitoring, I'm going to be reading that paper w- within hours or days that it comes out. And I'm if I assume that he monitors ICP the same way that I monitor ICP, I'm probably making a false assumption. So there's a lot of different ways that, that people monitor and and that that value comes into existence. Uh, we have, uh, and there's another paper coming out. I, I actually reviewed it, so I can't talk a lot about it, but the authors did a phenomenal job. Um, and anybody out in UCSF, way to go. Um, it turns out that the average length of time that a nurse looked at the ICP is probably about 21 to 42 seconds. Wow. And that, that, that that's just not, that's not enough time for it to stable out. Uh, Michael Rogers had done a study where he clamped the ICP, the EVD, and watched it over the course of 15 minutes. And in that 15 minutes, you had values that went up, then down, then up. Some went down, then up, then down. Some stayed flat. Some only went up. Some only went down. Uh, I don't think there's anyone listening who would disagree that ICP is a an extremely dynamic variable. The yeah. argument I would make is if we agree that it's dynamic... Why don't we monitor it as we would any other dynamic variable? Sure, it makes sense. It makes total sense. Let me tell you about another study that we did. We looked at 357 papers that had been published uh, on ICP, and we found a couple things that were fascinating. One is that most of the authors report ICP without reporting how it was documented. In other words, they say the ICP was as though, as though there's some fact behind that, right? Um, the ICP was 12. So if I were to say to you, the ICP was 12, what information do you, you know, let me ask you, Dick, what do you think is, what do you think is missing? The ICP is 12. Well, you don't know what's what happened before or after, just like you said. I think that's the yeah. issue. Yeah, right. you don't know what's before, right. you don't know what's after. Yeah. But what if I told you that some of these 12s are 12 millimeters of mercury, 
And some of these 12s are 12 centimeters of water. These aren't interchangeable. Now, 12, you could say, well, 12 millimeters of mercury, 12 centimeters of water, close with it. But what about when you get into 20, 30? 30 centimeters of water and 30 centimeters of, or 30 millimeters of mercury are two very different numbers. What if I told you it was 12 when they checked it for one minute at the end of an hour? Is that different from the highest value all day was 12? What if I, what if I said, um, they took once an hour the ICP and each day they averaged them together and it was 12. I mean, these are, these are all fundamentally different numbers for such a dynamic variable. And, uh, so that's one of the things I, I I think we really need to settle on is how are, how are we going to how are we going to do this like as a, a as a scientific endeavor as a group of 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 clinicians we should all mean pretty much the same thing when we say the ICP is 12 yeah but how do you change that well i think one way we change you know uh <laughs> I think one of the biggest things is uh, it's kind of like like Alcoholics Anonymous. Not that you or I would know anything about that, but um, the first step is sort of recognizing you have a problem. And I think I, I really do embrace that the first thing we got to do is we all have to agree that we are, in fact, different. We cannot decide who's doing it right until we at least agree that we're all different. That's that's the the number one step. Is we've got to we've got to quit pretending that ICP is the same and ICP is monitored the same. You know, when you have an intraparenchymal monitor that is is sitting next to a mass effect lesion, that is a different type of ICP monitor than an intraventricular catheter in the contralateral ventricle of a subarachnoid hemorrhage patient. They're, they're just not the same, right? Um, you're not reflecting the, the, the same problem. So, um, one is, is admitting we have a problem. I think the next biggest easiest step is to is to document exactly what you're getting if you're using millimeters of mercury document it for Christ's sake if you're using centimeters of water document it and then let's decide that these values should be converted if you're using a ventricular catheter that needs to be spelled out in the research study and 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 in the 357 studies we looked at they weren't there were, you know, there, there's some, of course, but, but it was not universally documented whether they used intraparenchymal or intraventricular or subdural or frequency. And then I think the next thing is we now have technology that we can watch that ICP during the entire hour and get certain variables that we've never gotten before. And it's not a big leap. I think that at 3:05, when the when the physician asked me, "Die, why? Tell me about the ICP." I can tell him, "Okay, well, the maximum ICP the past hour was was 42. The minimum ICP was 12. The average was 14, and the area under the curve above 20 was X, and." Maybe then we can say, you know, the, the peak systolic to diastolic difference on an ICP waveform, you know, if we look at the peak on P1 and we look at the lowest diastolic value, I mean, is, is that a relevant difference? When I was at Duke University, we used to document whether or not P2 was elevated in comparison to P1. 
you know, that compliance wave. And I think these are, are measures that are relatively easily obtained given the computing technology and, um, but you just, you, you, you have to, we have to make the commitment that we're going to look at the full hour of data instead of sort of spot checking what's going on. Sure. And concepts like, uh, the burden, I think are becoming popular, at least in epilepsy with seizures. And same thing with, uh, ICP, I think, uh, and, and, and brain oxygen. Yeah, you know, I think, I think the IC, the, the idea, so brain oxygen has uh, always fascinated me and I think something we should really be diving deeper into. But, uh, let's use the analogy of, of epilepsy. Imagine if in order to determine whether or not a patient had seizures, we decided that once a day at 12 o'clock, we would put some sort of seizure monitoring device on them. And if they didn't have a seizure, we would go, oh, they're seizure free. We'd be missing, you know, all, all kinds of data. Back in the, back in the eighties, when I started nursing, uh, we had, you know, <laughs> the old EEG machine that, that was like five feet long and two and a half feet wide. I mean, these monster reams of paper, we would run 10 minutes of, of strip uh, every hour because you couldn't afford to run the, the paper that much and you'd run out of ink and stuff. Well, now we've advanced our technology to where we do continuous EEG monitoring. I think it would be damn near malpractice now to not have the occasion of continuous EEG monitoring. And we don't, when you've got a patient hooked up to EKG, you don't say, well, I'm, I'm going to not monitor their heart rate and their heart rhythm for 59 minutes out of the hour. I mean, uh, imagine the lawsuit for, well, you know, it so happened that you, your loved one went into VTAC, but it, it wasn't when we were monitoring, so uh, we kind of missed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you know, unfortunately, I think some hospitals still do like a spot check in EEG and uh, not continuous, but... You know, let's let, let's go on to ICP. <laughs> so, I mean, we haven't we haven't really improved a whole lot in some places. Yeah, it's hard for us yeah. to be throwing throwing yeah. stones yeah. at, at other people's clouds right. out right now. Right, right. right. That's it. and and actually the the question I have is how how do you think this has affected some of the the big ICP uh, trials? I mean, Best Trip and even Boost uh, that rely on ICP. Um, do you have any comments on those? And, yeah, um, I do. And, and, um, you know, I've done a lot of thinking about this stuff and I, and I've talked to a lot of people. So like the, 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 the best trip trial, uh, I think what we learned there is if you have people monitor ICP who don't know how to monitor ICP, they don't do a very good job of it. It's not a very exciting conclusion in my mind. But what, what else we learned is that in that, the, the report on that trial, what and how ICP is monitored, really, it, it, it hit me, as I've read that now three different times, that what and how ICP is monitored is probably as important, if not more important, than whether or not you monitor ICP. And, and we can kind of dig into that a little bit deeper if you want, but then in the Booth study, uh, there were a couple things that, that jumped out at me when, when we were part of that trial, when I was at, at, at Duke, I was at a university that predominantly kept the EVD closed. So we were monitoring ICP more frequently. And one of the things of the Boost 3 trial was if the ICP was greater than 20 for five minutes, then you did an intervention. And if the ICP was not greater than, than, than 20 for five minutes, you did not do an intervention. And I remember a big discussion we had because we had documented at 2 p.m. the ICP was 20 or maybe it was 21. 
And at 3 p.m., the ICP was 21, and we didn't have an intervention documented between 2 and 3. And the monitor was like, well, you guys violated protocol. And we were like, no, we we didn't because it wasn't greater than 20 for a five-minute period. She said, well, it had to be because it went from 21 to 21, and she could draw a line. That's about 20. But because at Duke we were monitoring more frequently, we saw that the ICP went back down below 20 before it went back up above 20. And so with a dynamic, it was a sampling error that made it look like we violated protocol. But because we were monitoring it more closely, we saw that the ICP actually was fairly well controlled. In the middle of the boost trial, I moved to Dallas where UT Southwestern is predominantly a leave the EVD open. And when I got here, they only monitored the ICP once an hour. And at the end of every hour, they turned the stopcock for about 30 seconds. They looked at the ICP, and that's the number that got recorded. Now, I challenge anyone out there who's listening, go to your IC, go to your ICU tomorrow and find an EVD that's open. Turn that stopcock for 30 seconds. You will not get the same ICP in the first 30 seconds that you will in the next 14 minutes or even more importantly, the next 59 minutes and 30 seconds. ICP is a dynamic variable. So in being part of the Boost three, boost 2 study at two different institutions, it really hit home to me how important the difference in monitoring is. And um, now I think what you're starting to see in literature is the people who are doing continuous monitoring and, and have the ability to, to acquire data continuously and analyze it, they're coming up with some really important questions and some really important data that I think is going to fundamentally change how we think about ICP. Boost 3, because they're collecting continuous data, I think they're seeing that oxygen values also go up and down. No, exactly. And there's some correlation between the, the ICP, but it doesn't seem to be linked in time. It seems to be staggered a bit. So, Right. It's, it's not, and it's not, from what I've seen at least, unless somebody's written another paper, it's not predictable. Right. You know, you can't say if the ICP is X, there's no formula that says if the ICP is X, the PBTO2 will be X plus whatever. Correct, yeah. And uh, nor will you, nor are you able to say that if the ICP is it value is X at two o four p.m., the PBTO two at one fifty four or two fifteen will be Y. Right. Right. You know. Yeah. So I just wanted to uh, tell our listeners that we have a group called the. Um, working group on neurocritical care informatics. And one of the things we are trying to do is look at standards in nomenclature and um, how do you homogenize data. And this might be a good venue for looking at uh, the variability in the way people monitor ICP. So maybe we'll bring that up as one of our, our topics, Daiwai. And thanks so much for uh, opening everybody's eyes to uh, the issues here. And in terms of nomenclature, I applaud, I, I, I applaud the fact that, uh, in neurocritical care, probably more than any other discipline, the physicians are really working with the nurses. I mean, we are partnering, and I think that's going to help us, uh, standardize care a lot more because the information that I as a nurse give to the physician, if I give my physician crappy information, it's really hard for that person to make a good decision. So I think in, in, in neuro ICU, we see that. And, and we also see so much with, with trend. Thanks, Daiwai. Well, we've come to the end of our time. And I just want to say you've done a great job, as always, of pointing out that ICP monitoring is a standard of care, but it actually has no standards. 
And I know I speak for everybody in this field and that we really appreciate your diligence and uh, waving the flag uh, in this respect. And hopefully we can all start to work together to address these issues. So thanks again for being our guest today, and it's always fun talking to you. Thanks. So thanks for listening to this week's podcast. If you enjoy these interviews, please take a moment to rate and review this show on your podcast app of choice. Subscribe to Dick Moberg's Neural Network to receive notifications when future installments are available. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you'll join us again soon.